Maybe I should have gone with the English uh, boxes. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everybody. This is Zelaz. This is. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've streamed. Um, hello, everybody. This is Zelaz. Pronoun she, her. And I am streaming streaming now I guess maybe um yeah I'm gonna start streaming some of the okay um so this Wednesday uh this Wednesday is the first day of the new Japanese era, um, so, which changes every time a new, um, a new, sorry, mine's blanking out here, um, a new emperor ascends to the throne, um, so, like, the emperor for the Heisei era, which started in which started after the previous emperor died in uh, like January 7th, 1989. Um, so that was the start of the Heisei era. Um, today we're going to start look at, we're going to look at some of the um, last games of the previous era, the Showa era, um, which was some of the... I'm sorry, my, my mind's blanking out. I, I kind of decided to do this stream, like, at the... at the very last moment, so I don't have, like, a... a script or anything prepared. Um, I barely had anything to eat. Um, but I did say I wanted to start this stream at around 7 o'clock. Um, so, here I am. Um... Right, so, this week is the final week of the Heisei era. Um, this is a pr pretty big deal in Japan. A lot of people still use kind of the imperial um, method of, like, the imperial calendar, which, like, divides... Instead of using, um, like, our years, like 2019, stuff like that, they it's like... Eh, period name followed by the year. So this would be like Heisei 30 or something. Um, and like at the, after this Wednesday it'll be the new era is going to be Reiwa. And so it'll be the beginning of Re Reiwa 1. So um, yeah. So in I guess in kind of celebration of that um, we're gonna look at some of the last games of the previous era, um, which were released, like, so I'm mostly going to be looking at games released, like, at the tail end of, um, 1988, and a few, a few games that were released at the beginning of 1989, before the Emperor's death, um, on January 7th. So I, I just kind of want to, I kind of want to show off like where video games were at at that time, and um, we're mostly, well, we're all of the games we're going to be looking at right now are going to be like TV console games. So we won't really be looking at any like computer games released around this time, and I'll be going off of Japanese release dates because like. Japanese dates are kind of what I'm basing the whole premise of this thing on, really. Um, so, I think I've rambled long enough. Let's go ahead and start our exploration of the latter days of the Showa era um, with a game released. Um, 
on September the 14th of 1988. You can probably already see it in the corner over here. Um, I got the... It, it's a game for the PC Engine, also known as the TurboGrafx-16. Um, for those not aware, the TurboGrafx-16 was a a system designed to be a competitor to the Sega Genesis and um, the Nintendo Entertainment System, although like it predated the Genesis by quite quite a bit. And in Japan, it was called the the PC Engine. Um, so, where is that? Okay. Let me go ahead and full screen this. Um, huh. Okay, give me one moment. Hmm. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't seem like my chat window. Oh, sorry. My chat window on the side of the on the side of my stream doesn't seem to be working, um, which is kind of a shame. I don't know if I. Oh, give me a give me a moment. Um, Maybe if I uh, pop out the chat here. And then move this. Add. I'm sorry. I Again, it's been a while since I've. It's been a while since I've streamed, so I don't really have everything like set up that well. A new source. Hey, Kate. That's not it. Um... I guess while you're here, is my is my voice um, can my voice be heard over the volume of the game? Because I haven't been messing with the volume sliders all that much. Uh, dang, that's not it either. There is no game volume. Great. Okay. Um, gonna have to be. Oh no, no, that's not what I want. Um, remove. Okay, I'm gonna mess with that later. Um, okay. Properties. Okay, so it when I updated Streamlabs, it pretty much erased all my audio um, stuff. That's great. Okay. Um, any volume now? Like, awesome! Can you hear me over the v game volume, though? Like, that's pretty key, too. Um. Okay, um. Turn down the volume here. Okay, how's that? Turn down the game volume here a little bit. T 
too quiet. Also, I am. <laughs> oh my goodness. I didn't think it was 60%. Uh, because I do kind of want the game volume to show it through, because some of these games will have like pretty good uh, game music. Like this game, um, Alien or Crush. Anyway, um, okay, I think I've... I think I've <laughs> stalled quite a bit enough. So, for anyone who's just joining in, um, we're taking a look at a lot of the... We're taking a look at some of the games that were released at the end of the Showa era of the... of Japanese history. Um, the Showa era encompasses, like, the time period between, like, 1923 and up to up to January 7th, 1989, um, which was when the Emperor before the current Emperor died. Um, as you can tell, that encompasses a lot of time. And within the time, like, the birth of, like, console video games took place. Um, and, like, in celebration of our current era, Heisei, ending this... Wednesday, we're going to be looking at some of the games that the Showa era ended in, and tomorrow we're going to be looking at some of the games that the Heisei era, our current era, began with. So, this game, released um, August 14th, 1988, was a game for the uh, PC Engine, or TurboGrafx-16, which was like this card-based um, game system. And this game, Alien Crush, is a wire, um, a video pinball game. Okay. I should probably be. Oh goodness! I should probably be playing this on a on a controller because it's kind of feels awkward playing on a keyboard, because because one side of the controller, um, the directional buttons control one flipper, and the other, like the face buttons, control the other flipper, but since, like, the direction keys are, and, like, face buttons are swapped on a keyboard, like, The left side of my keyboard is controlling the right flipper, and the right side the left side. So it's a little... It's a little awkward. So I'm trying to make do by, like, switching up my hands. Which, like, works sort of, kind of. Of course, it really doesn't matter, because I kind of suck at, <laughs> at pinball games. I still keep playing them, though, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah... This was, at the time, um, considered, like, one of the best, um, pinball experiences you could really buy for, like, home systems. Um, like, people obviously weren't really able to buy, um, actual pinball tables for their homes back in the day, and this is this game is a fair bit more complicated than, like, some of the stuff you could get for the Nintendo Entertainment System, or for, like, computers back at the time. And, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts on uh, some of these tables, and, like, this game has, like, quite a, a strong um, Aliens aesthetic. Like, back in 1988, um, like the hype around uh, the hype around stuff like movies like Aliens and stuff like that was still pretty strong. So 
a game based on, like, creepy, um, Geiger-esque aliens would have resonated with a lot of people. Um... I'm not sure what's a bit wonky. Are my is my audio a bit wonky still or okay, anyway, as as you would have no doubt noticed, um Yep, uh that didn't go too well. Um this table actually has like two halves of it, but each with like a different set of flippers. Um, and not only is there two halves of this of this table, but there are several um, several bonus games that I could get my ball warped into, which I mean you didn't really see a lot of in um, even in video pinball. Um, for anyone who's played, like, for anyone who's played, like, Pokemon Pinball, or, um, like, any of the more modern pinball games for, like, Game Boy Advance, or the Game Boy Color, um, you would have, like, this game has a lot of the DNA of those later games, um, And yeah, I think like those games owe a lot to games like uh, Alien Crush and the later Demons Crush and um, well Devil Crush. It was called what is it? What was it called in um, when it was released here? Um, Dragons something. Anyway. Um, yeah, but. This, for a pinball game, which is pretty simplistic, it's a pretty simplistic, like, scoring game. Like, there's not really an ending to shoot for or anything. It This is still quite a bit playable today. Yeah, the keyboard controls are a little wonky. <laughs> um, and, like, anyone who's, like, enjoyed Pokemon Pinball... Um, like, you could, and who are, who's, like, really into this sort of aesthetic, like I am, um, like, it's not too hard to really find the enjoyment in a game like this. Um, I'm actually surprised this ball is lasting as long as it has. Like, with unwonky controls, I'm usually... By now, I've usually drained all of my balls. <laughs> no, but seriously, this is probably the best I've played in a while. <laughs> and I play this every now and then on my... Um, 3DS. This what? By the way, this was um, released for the Japanese 3D, 3DS um, Virtual Console. Not quite sure why it never made it here. I mean, this game was pretty well liked here when it was like re-released for the Wii Virtual Console, and I think it even got like a Wii um, a remake of some sort. Although I, like, I'm aware it exists. I don't. But I've never really seen screenshots of it or anything. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah, this is Alien Crush. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and play through play through these balls 
before moving on to the next game, because this is... For someone who's having to cross their arms to play this, I think I'm doing pretty well. It's kind of weird, really. So, the developers of this game, um, Naxat, they actually went on to do a few other pinball games. I've mentioned Devil's Crush before. That was released on um, the TurboGrafx-16, like this game, but it was also released for the Sega Genesis under a different name. Um, I am blanking out on the name, still. <laughs> um... Like, Dragon's Trap. I... No, that's a different game. Um... But yeah, that was released in 1990, and... Those games are considered, like, some of the best pinball games on, like, the Genesis and TurboGrafx-16, respectively. Um, those... have more of a medieval, demonic theme to it. Uh... And then, I think in, what, 93, 95, um, they released a game for the Super Famicom, the Japanese Super Nintendo, called Jockey Crush, which has more of a Japanese demon myth mythology theme, and, like, I really like the look of that game. It's just creepy all around, and, like, it, it really is, like, one of my favorite, um, like, maybe my favorite. Maybe my, actually my favorite um, pinball game for the for the Super Nintendo. Um, so, in summation, uh, Naxat is pretty good at pinball games. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to our next game <laughs> because I don't want to just bore you guys with oops, sorry, with just pinball here. So we're gonna go into another TurboGrafx-16 game. Um, this one released um, September 23rd, 1988. Um, let's see here. Here we go. And then let me change the box art. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um This is the legendary axe. Um one of the more one of the more famous action um, type games for the TurboGrafx-16, certainly like one of the best um, early games for the system. Uh, fans of like old school Castlevania will notice that it plays a lot like old Castlevania, like Castlevania without all the exploring castles. So. Um, this would have been a pretty big deal in 1988, because, well, this would have been released 
shortly before the release of the Japanese um, Sega Genesis. Um, so this game looks a lot better than a lot of the stuff that was on um, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the Famicom at the time. Um, like, the sprites are pretty big. Um, the graphics look like something you would see out of the arcade at the time. But, like, this isn't actually, like, a port of an arcade game. Um, it is similar and sort of made by the same guys who made... It's like a spiritual successor to um, an arcade game called uh, Astyanax, or The Lord of King, or I think that's what it was called. Um, but this isn't actually like a straightforward port. Um, you'll probably notice that there's a bar at the top of the screen that kind of denote that denotes um, it's like a power bar, and the more it's filled, the more powerful my swings are. So um, that kind of encourages more careful play instead of just like hitting the attack button over and over. So like a fully Two fully charged swings would kill that guy instead of like four weak swings. And like as I progress, I can get the power bar to get to be larger, which means I'll have to wait longer, but I'll be able to throw more um, powerful swings. Here I'm doing what man does best, violently rebelling against nature. And that was the first stage. You clear first zone. Gotta try the second zone. Because Flare is waiting for you. Flare being this guy's girlfriend. It was the 80s. People had names like that. Um, yeah, this game's really nice and colorful. Also, kinda heckin' hard. It's a good thing, though, that unlike like some of the older Castlevania, well, like, some of the Castlevanias from this time, um, you're not knocked back for... <laughs> Zero. Cool. I suppose so. Um, yeah, at least you're gonna, you don't get knocked back every time you get hit. Otherwise, this game would be a lot harder than it already is. I'm, I'm good at games, I swear. <laughs> it's just been, like, years since I've played this. So... Yeah, this game actually... I think I've mentioned this before. But I, this game really requires a more methodical um, playstyle than just like going in gung ho, swinging your axe all the time. Of course, a little bit of memorization wouldn't hurt either. I just killed that rock. As you do. So the boss of this stage is just literally a rock. Um, we're gonna do better than that. <laughs> no, but seriously, the stage of this 
level is kind of annoying, because what you're supposed to do is use that rope. Man, that rock exploded real good. To not... to avoid getting hit. Also, I didn't want to get that full heal power up just yet. Like, you really gotta time your jumping on that rope to... I'm gonna hit it. Okay, maybe it's better to just hit it while it's coming towards me. Okay, so now we've proved that I am not dumber than a literal rock. Let's try the third zone, which I don't think I've ever beaten. So, this is going to be very interesting. And as you can see, with the power we've gained, we can actually kill those green guys in like one hit now, which is very nice. Except we're going to be encountering much stronger enemies here very shortly. Oh god, more rocks. Yeah, I didn't know that was gonna kill me. <laughs> um, so that was Legendary Axe. It's a really good game. Um, and I recommend emulating it or finding some way to play it because it's really good. Um, so next we're going to be moving on to the Nintendo Entertainment System, actually, um, with a little game released on October the 23rd of 1988. Um, I was kind of debating on whether or not I should put in these games that were released, like, August and October, and uh, September and October of 88, because it seemed a little too far away from, like, the end of the Showa era, but these are some of, like, the Legendary Axe and um, Alien Crush in this game, especially, like, really really made an impact around that time, so it seemed... it, it seemed... ill-advised to not include them in a stream like this. So, released in October of 1988 was a little game known as Super Mario Bros. 3. Um, let me go ahead and update that box. So this was released on the Nintendo Entertainment System, which, um... looked us quite a bit was on lesser hardware than the TurboGrafx 16 so it doesn't look quite as good as the games we just played but um, games on on that on the super on, on the Nintendo um, on the NES were a fair bit more complicated than the ones on like the PC engine and the um, well, the TurboGrafx-16 and the Genesis at the time, because, like, these games had more time to, like, really evolve. And this game is considered, like, the pinnacle of platforming games of the Nintendo Entertainment System. And certainly a lot of games after this would, like, crib a lot from this game. Like, kind of the screen layout and the visual style. This was really a landmark title for um, the NES. And, like, even though it was released on lesser, ha on hardware, 
weaker than um, the TurboGrafx-16 and the Genesis. Like, you can already tell this game is like really colorful for its time. Um, so it's really not hard to see like why this made such a large impact um, in Japan back in 1988 and in America when it was released um, in 1990, which was quite a long time after <laughs> after the Japanese release. There really isn't a lot to say about the actual gameplay. I mean, if you've played a two-dimensional Mario, you kind of know what you're going for here. Um, like, in, in comparison to um, the first Mario Bro Super Mario Brothers, um, like, the, the physics have been tightened up quite a bit, so Mario isn't as slippery as he was in the first game. Um, also, I will be probably missing a lot of uh, secrets here. Well, I won't really be going for secrets here because I'm just kind of showing off this game kind of casually. Um, but like it, it, this game improved a lot on um, the like how the first game felt and. Um, Wow. I'm playing like I was when I was like six years old. It's kind of nostalgic, really. Also, you really gotta love the... If you can hear it, like the percussion in this game's soundtrack, which is not something you could really hear in a lot of soundtracks for the NES. Like, especially in 1988. Like, it might be a little hard to see. It, it might be a little hard to um, visualize, but this game really was kind of at the cutting edge back in 1988, as far as the NES went. A little secret, as long as you, um, if you're running and you come at the box from a 45 degree angle, um, I think it'll, it'll always give you a star. So that's an easy way to, like, rack up lives in this game. Not that it's very hard to rack up lives on in this game. I am terrible at this. And then watch me screw it up. Wow. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not so bad at games. So now we have the fire, but people don't play this Mario iteration for the fire power up. No, they want the the leaf. So like in addition to a pretty solid platforming gameplay like 
the Mario series was like really known for kind of its nifty, like the nifty secrets that the game would, that the, um, that the game would like throw at you every now and then. I'm sure it made a lot of guidebook publishers very rich at the time. This in games like The Legend of Zelda and stuff like that. I don't... Yeah, the... The Lives Mushroom despawned. That's great. Anyway, um... Okay, that wasn't good. I seem to be forgetting a... It doesn't matter. I remember a lot of people seemed to debate on, like, whether or not this uh, Super Mario World was better. Um, which is kind of a weird question for me, because, um, I grew up with, like, the Super Nintendo version of this and Mario World for the Super Nintendo. Um, and in my mind, they're kind of both equally good. Um, I'm not really sure why I brought up that point. Anyway, Mario is good. I'm good at video games. Uh, so I think I've shown off like what this game is all about. Uh, it's it's pretty much this for eight worlds. Which he, with each world encompassing like a different, a different theme. Um, actually, let me go ahead and finish up this world, and I can warp to another. I'll warp to another. Oops. One of the more creative worlds. Maybe show it off. I mean, I could easily play this for like an hour, really. But I, I have a few more of I have a few other games I'd like I would like to show off. Um